Good morning. It is Monday, August the 27th. This is The Drill. And thank you very much. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. So, overrated. That's the one word that best describes John McCain and his uh, entire life and career. Absolutely overrated. Take it from the beginning. Uh, John McCain is called a hero. And he's called, he's a dupe of the left, by the way. He's uh, called a hero by the left. And the left uses the word, word hero uh, to describe everything and everybody. You get up in the morning, you're a hero. You go to work, you're a hero. You pay your taxes, you're a hero. And they use the word hero, overuse it, in order to get rid of it. It's one of their ways of trying to get rid of war. And also, uh, well, anyways, they're trying to get rid of war, and one of the ways to do that is get rid of the lingo associated with war. If you can get rid of heroism, then uh, ostensibly there's no reason for uh, people to uh, join the military. If there's nobody to join the military, uh, then we'll never ever have any more wars, and uh, peace will reign, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, he's a hero. Now, let's look at hero is a person that sacrifices themselves to save another. Simply put, let's look at uh, John McCain's military career, at least from the perspective of his getting um, ending up in a prison prisoner of war camp in Vietnam. Uh, John McCain was uh, flying uh, jets for the Navy and um, he uh, got shot down was captured and put in a prisoner of war's camp for several years. So, uh, was that honorable? Yes. Was his service honorable? No doubt about it. There's no evidence there was anything else other than honorable. And he deserves to be commended for that. He had honorable service to this country, honorable service to the Navy. Good for him. But it was not heroic. He was... He, his situation, he is in prison and, and stayed in prison because of failures on his part. Three failures put him in uh, that position. Number one is uh, three, the failures of three missions, okay, uh, because he had three separate missions uh, that he failed at, and that's the reason he spent uh, the time he did in um, uh, Vietnam, uh, in a Vietnamese uh, prisoner war camp. Number one mission was his original mission, whatever it was in terms of uh, going out and putting hot steel on target. Uh, It might have been close air support. uh, It might have been a bombing mission. Whatever it was, he failed because he got shot down. Okay. Now, he gets shot down. Now he has a second mission. Any person, uh, if you're in the Air Force, Navy, whatever, and you're flying and you get shot down, you've got a new mission. Your new mission is to escape and evade. Okay, uh, or evade and escape, either way. So you um, try to get away from the enemy, escape, get back to your side, your forces. And John McCain failed again. He was captured by uh, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese. Now he has a new mission. Okay, when you become a prisoner of war, you're told, and I was in the Air Force. Uh, for a number of years, and we were told that that your number one duty when you're captured, when you become a prisoner of war, is to escape. That's what your job is. That's your new mission, escape. And he failed at that as well. He he was eventually uh, released as part either at the end of the war or as a part of a prisoner exchange or something of that nature, but he did not escape. Now, he may very well have tried, but the point is, he didn't do it. He had all of these failures. Now, there's no evidence that any of these fa- failures came about because he was trying to protect somebody else. If he was shot down originally because he took a missile to protect somebody else from getting shot down, that's heroic. 
okay, didn't happen. He, if he is on the ground trying to escape and evade, and he deliberately gets himself captured in order that others may escape, that's heroic. Didn't happen. If he is in prison and he uh, deliberately gets caught trying to escape, let's say, in order that others could escape, that's heroic. No such thing occurred. Not, nothing about his service was heroic. President Trump was right. President Trump was a little bit clumsy in the way he went about expressing this. Okay, if he'd gone ahead and put some detail into it, uh, it would have gone over uh, a little bit better. Not much, but it would have gone over a little bit better because it's a controversial thing to say. We all feel sorry for John McCain because he spent a number of years in a prisoner of war camp. Uh, there's evidence that he was beaten and badly mistreated while he was in there, and he didn't deserve that. <clears throat> but that doesn't make him a hero. It just means that he served honorably. And he deserves all the gratitude uh, that I and this country can muster for that. Okay, but he's not a hero. Now, second part where he's considered a hero is because he was in the habit of contradicting the uh, Republican Party. The Republican Party, the same one that got him elected senator in the first place and got him reelected for 30 years. And uh, he would go against the party on a regular basis. Uh, again, there's no evidence that going against the party uh, did anything to help anybody else, that he was making some sort of a sacrifice. If he went ahead and sacrificed his political career in order to help somebody else, that's heroic. He didn't do that, okay, because he was uh, re-elected, re-elected, and re-elected. I mean, he, I think six times, I am guess five times. If it's a 30-year career, then uh, it would be uh, five times for uh, John McCain. So he's re-elected for five times, and uh, so uh, nothing heroic about his Senate, although uh, his Senate career, although um, the news people want everybody to believe he's a hero and believe he's a hero because he was willing to stand up not to the Democrats, not to the socialists, not to the newspapers, but because he was willing to stand up to the Republican Party. No. Uh, all that makes him is not a hero, just a pain in the ass. Uh, furthermore, uh, this is a man that had uh, hate, he hated, I mean, he had, uh, he had his, I imagine he hated Donald, well, I know he hated President Trump, no doubt about that. Hated uh, Donald Trump's gut so bad, he was willing to have, send a staff member over to England to pick up a document that uh, slandered President Trump. And he didn't give a damn whether it was accurate or not accurate, slander or not slander. As long as it made uh, President Trump look bad, that's all he gave a damn about. He was a bitter, frustrated, and uh, hateful old man. He also hated George W. Bush. Both uh, and the two things that uh, Trump and or the one thing that Trump and uh, uh, George W. Bush have in common is that they both beat John McCain. Okay, so uh, he, uh, anyway, so he's full of hatred. Anyways, none of this, the point is, is heroic. There's nothing about him that's heroic. He served honorably. He served honorably in the Senate. Now, there was that one thing of the, uh, where he was, uh, I don't know if he was put on trial, but there was a, the Keating, the Keating 5 or the Keating 7 that he was part of where there was this, a scandal about, something to do with uh, perhaps illegal campaign contributions, and this was about 20 years ago or so. And he was, uh, John McCain was part of that, part of that investigation. And um, so I'd have to look it up to get all the details on it. But other than that, a little, uh, little smirch there, um, he served honorably in the military, he served honorably in the Senate, and that's, that's what he deserves, how he deserves to be remembered, not as a hero. So, back in a minute. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, welcome back. And uh, right now I'm going to be reading from, uh, Visa and MasterCard block David Horowitz from the Friday episode of uh, uh, Rush Limbaugh. Rush, we all know who David Horowitz is. A, he has a website called Front Page Mag. He grew up as a child of communists in New York. Let me scratch. scratch. Uh, start it again. Rush, we all know who David Horowitz is. He grew up as a child of communists in New York. He was a child communist, a young adult communist, till someday he magically saw the light and has become a conservative activist. Very visible, very public. He has a thing in Palm Beach every November called Restoration Weekend where a bunch of conservatives pay a bunch of money to come stay at the Breakers and listen to a weekend slate filled with conservative speakers and motivational speakers and so forth. The David Horowitz Freedom Center is an offshoot of his many organizations that he's established. The Horowitz Freedom Center accepts donations. It's a 501c3. They raise money to help various charitable causes. And get this, the David Horowitz Freedom Center has had their donation processing system blocked by Visa and MasterCard, allegedly uh, following a campaign by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um Visa has since contacted Breitbart News to deny involvement in the blacklisting of the Freedom Center. The David Horowitz Freedom Center stated in a recent email that its ability to accept donations by credit card has been disabled by both Visa and MasterCard following a campaign by the SPLC, Southern Poverty Law Center, to label the Freedom Center as a hate group. The situation comes shortly after Robert Spencer of Jihad Watch was forced off the funding platform Patreon following pressure from MasterCard. It's the same principle here. Now, Visa is denying it. Who is the Southern Poverty Law Center? The Southern Poverty Law Center, these people have so much money that they have it parked in offshore accounts in the Caymans and elsewhere where nobody can get to it. They may be shielding and hiding from tax authorities their own income. I don't know why else you would have offshore accounts. That may not be, but it's been discovered that they do business that way. And when they find anybody else uh, doing business that way, you have an offshore account. The left is looking at you. You know damn well what they're going to speculate about you. Well, anyway, the Southern Poverty Law Center sets itself up as the arbiter of which groups in America are hate-sponsored, hate-filled, and hate-promoting. And it's practically every conservative organization out there. And here these corporations come along and they don't even challenge it. Southern Poverty Law Center says X is a hate group. They just accept it and they act accordingly. Now, in the Horowitz case, they were making it impossible for people to donate to that charity simply because it's conservative and because the Southern Poverty Law Center said so. This is exactly how the battle over your guns and getting them away from you is being waged. It's just a trickle now. It's just starting, but it has ominous potential. Corporations are not brave. Corporations try to find out which way the wind is blowing and get right in it. They don't want to buck trends. They don't want to be against the wind and they want to be perceived as hip. So climate change, they're all in, whether they believe it or not. They want people to think they do. And it's leftist causes that they get uh, bullied into supporting. Remember GE? Remember it wasn't long ago, 10 or 15 years ago, where every major American company had some kind of green initiative as part of its marketing to separate you from your dollars? Remember the automobile company running commercials for its cars, starting out with how polar bears have no place to live because global warming's melting all their ice? Then some guy goes out and buys him a hybrid electric car, and the polar bear finds out and is waiting in the driveway for the new owner to get home to hug him for buying an electric car, thereby enabling the polar bear to live. Mm. If the polar bear had been in the guy's driveway, the guy would be dead the moment he got out of the car, but this is the latest effort underway. So get past this idea that you could uh, make them like you, and uh, they're even interested in that because they hate you too much. They literally do Folks, okay, so um, the reason I want to read this is because, again, here's another opportunity that it goes by the wayside, another opportunity passed on by a conservative, perhaps, uh, or ersatz uh, conservative. And this is the opportunity to strike a balance, strike the difference, make a difference between uh, conservatives and socialists. And uh, he failed to uh, do that. He had it basically in two ways. Number one way was, again, to say, look at what uh, the left is doing here. We would never do this. Okay, 
uh, the Republican Party, the conservative movement, the conservative people as a whole would never, ever stoop so low as to do something like this. Because we have standards. We have values. We are better people than they are. And make that damn case. Instead, Mr. Limbaugh goes ahead and makes it seem as though, first, it's, it comes across, all, he doesn't go out, so it goes so far as to make it sound like he's jealous. Why can't we do the same thing, which he frequently does in these kinds of cases. But he does make it go out and make it sound like uh, a whiny. Oh, feel sorry for us. We're poor, pathetic slobs just minding our own business. And these mean, wicked, powerful lefties come along and take all our money from us and won't let us donate, won't let us do this. They're almost like children with their, you know, complaining to their parents, you won't let me do anything. Guy, you won't let me do anything. And this is crap for a lot of reasons. Number one is the morale of your own people. If I'm a conservative and I'm a Rush Limbaugh, Erzatz conservative, and I'm reading this, this doesn't make me feel better. Nothing about this makes me feel better. Okay? And another thing is that if I'm 17 or 18 years old and I'm starting to uh, get into the political process and, and wondering, should I get involved? And if so, in in what direction? do I go, Am I socialist? Am I... Um, conservative, uh, there's a very good chance that I'm going to say e- either I'm going to go with uh, the left on this because Rush Limbaugh is making an excellent case that the left is unbelievably powerful. They have, uh, they have all this tremendous amounts of power and that the Republican Party is hypnotized by it and mesmerized and uh, we're on the verge of being uh, completely and utterly uh, destroyed and defeated. We meaning uh, conservatives. So if I'm if I'm um, a kid and I'm going to think, huh, why do I want to go even if I have conservative values with the Republicans? Why would I want to go with those folks? Because uh, after all, the left is the one with all the power. I'm going to have a tendency to lean. To the left, I'm going to have a tendency to want to go Democrat, because after all, Rush Limbaugh himself says these people are tremendously powerful. Now, at the, at the very least, what he's doing is he's, he is morally equivocating. He is saying that the Democrats and the Republicans are basically the same, he, because he fails to draw the distinction. Okay, He makes no value judgments here. Okay, and so he's basically saying that Republicans Republicans would do, he suggests, it's a very vague suggestion, that Republicans would do the same things if they thought they could get away with it, as what the Democrats are doing. So if I'm a, a potential new voter, and I'm looking at this from a moral standpoint, do I go Democrat, do I go Republican, I'm going to say, you know what, F you both. I'll go independent, or refuse to state. And go that direction. So he's doing no good for his constituents, his listeners. Uh, the, he's not helping their morale. He's not helping them feel better about themselves or their party or their country at all. And he's doing nothing to attract new voters. Shame on him. Back in a minute. Thank you very much. Welcome back. And uh, since uh, my monologue has uh, a little bit to do with uh, David Horowitz, um, I feel it's appropriate to uh, read another chapter from David Horowitz's book called The Black Book of the American Left. And this is chapter seven, A Political Romance. When I was in uh, when I was a college literature student in the 1950s, my Shakespeare professor drew our attention to the way the poet turned to romance as he grew older, writing symbolic pastorals devoted to themes of redemption. According to my professor, this was a natural human progression, and he cited examples from other writers to prove his point. Youth is characterized by a hunger for information, he told us. Age distills what it knows in parables and returns to archetypal myths. 
When Shakespeare wrote The Tempest, the most famous of his late romances and the very last of his plays, he was actually only 47, more than a decade younger than I am now. Moreover, I have found my own experience to be exactly the opposite of what he predicted. Growing up in a progressive household, I found myself enveloped in the vapors of a romantic myth not unlike that of Shakespeare's pastorals or the fairy tales that had been read to me as a child. In the radical romance of our political lives, the world was said to have begun in innocence, but to have fallen afterwards under an evil spell, afflicting the lives of all with great suffering and injustice. According to our myth, however, a happy ending beckoned. Through the efforts of progressives like us, the spell would one day be lifted and mankind freed from its trials. In this liberated future, social justice would be established, peace would reign, and harmony prevail. Men and women would be utterly transformed. Being at the center of a heroic myth inspired passions that informed my youthful passage and guided me to the middle of my adult life. But then I was confronted by a reality so inescapable and harsh that it shattered the romance for good. A friend was brutally murdered by my political comrades, members of the very vanguard that had been appointed to redeem us all. Worse, since individuals may err, the deed was covered up by the vanguard itself, which hoped, in so doing, to preserve the faith. If this personal tragedy had remained isolated, perhaps the romance itself could have survived, but the murder of my friend was reflected and amplified in numerous others, most notably the slaughter of millions of poor peasants in Southeast Asia by the Liberation Fronts, the Angels of Progress whom my comrades and I aided and defended. There was no happy ending. The injustice of the new orders was even greater than what had existed before. In retrospect, it was apparent to me that the most of the violence in my lifetime had been directed by utopians like myself against those who would not go along with their impossible dreams. Idealism kills, the philosopher Nietzsche had warned before all this bloodshed began, but nobody listened. As a result of my experience, I developed in age an aversion to romantic myths. What I experienced instead was a hunger for information, for the facts that would reveal to me the truth about the years I remember as of a heroic vanguard. The fall of the communist empire and the opening of its secrets fed this passion. Preserved in the decoded Venona communications between Soviet agents in America and their contacts in the Kremlin is the record of the truths we had denied and whose denial made our romance possible. The truths revealed that we were just what our enemies had always said we were. They were spies among us and we were agents for a tainted cause. All of us had treason in our hearts in the name of a future that would never come. In the battle of good and evil that formed the core of our romantic myth, we had enlisted old and new left alike on the wrong side of the historical conflict. We had set out as the proud harbingers of a progressive future, but what we had actually created were realities far worse than those we were seeking to escape. The enemies we scorned, patriots defending America, turned out to be the protectors of what was decent and pragmatically good, who had saved us from being consumed by our crimes. It became clear to me that the world was not going to be changed into anything very different or better from what it had been. On this earth, there would be no kingdom of freedom where swords would be turned into plowshares and lions would lie down with lambs. It should have been obvious when I began. Many things change, but people do not. Otherwise, how could Shakespeare or writers more ancient capture in their creations a reality that we recognize and that still moves us today? These revelations of experience had a humbling effect. They took my attention away from the noble fantasies that had enveloped me and forced me to focus on my own ordinary existence, to see how common it was, how unheroic, ordinary, and unredeemed. The revelations that shattered my faith allowed me, for the first time, to look at my mortality, at the fact that I was not going to be born again in a brave new world, that I was going to die like everyone else and be forgotten. And that is when I realized that our roman what our romance was about. It was not about a future that was socially just or about a world redeemed. It was about averting our eyes from this ordinary fact. Our romance was a shield protecting us from the terror of our common human fate. And that was why we cling to our dream. We clung to our dream so fiercely, despite all the evidence that it had failed. This is why we continued to believe, despite everything we knew, for... Who would want to confront the terror of ordinary existence without some sustaining faith, unless forced to do so by circumstances beyond their control? Who would want to hear the voice of a future that was only calling them to oblivion? 
and that is when I also realized that our progressive romance would go on. Some, like myself, might wake from its vapors under blows that cause great personal pain, but there would be always be others, and in far greater number, who would not. A century of broken dreams and the slaughters they spawned would, in the end, teach nothing to those who had no reason to hear. Least of all would it cure them of their hunger for a romance that is really a desire not to know who we are. David uh, Horowitz, The Black Book of the American Left, and uh, Volume 1, and um, I uh, really enjoy reading David Horowitz because uh, he knows what he's talking about. So many people, uh, ersatz conservatives, don't know what the hell they're talking about. Claim to know the left, how the left operates, how they think, and they don't. If you, if you really want to know how they operate, talk to a former lefty. Okay, uh, David Horowitz, for example. Tammy Bruce, for another example. Two great people. If you want to read David, I don't know that he's on. I mean, he gives interviews and whatnot, but I don't know that he has a, uh, a radio program or a television show. Uh, but if, if he does, then uh, certainly, uh, you know, tune in. Uh, but read his books, and I encourage you also, Tammy Bruce does have um, a radio show, and I'm going to make it my mission to uh, find out for next time exactly on what um, frequency she is heard so I can um, let everybody know. But she's well worth listening to. She used to be on, I believe it was KBC here in Los Angeles, and uh, I used to listen to her, and I was... Um, it was really, really dramatic difference between her and, say, Rush Limbaugh in terms of insight, being able to really have a penetrating insight into what the left is really all about. So, uh, in at this point, that uh, brings us to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. I thank you very much for listening, and have a great day.